One of the great things about the commercial real estate world is that every bank, they're all different. It's not like one set of policies and rules that applies to everyone. Did the bank consider your short-term rental revenues as part of that refinancing? We're almost to the end getting the green light and it's like we had to start over. Have you ever sold any of your properties as turnkey or has your strategy been mainly buy and hold? My debt to income ratio actually improved after getting the first property and it improved after getting the second property. How do I put a process in place that can run without my involvement? All right, welcome everyone to the Hospitality Edge podcast, where we bring together what we think are two sides of the same coin, real estate and hospitality. And today I'm very excited to have Tim Hobbard with me. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but I tried. Uh, he is the founder of Midtown Stays and the host of Short-Term Rental Reaches. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have you on, Tim. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to chat. Absolutely. So, Tim, why don't we start with just you telling us a little bit more about your background? How do you get into hospitality, short-term rentals, you know, real estate? What was sort of those early developments that led you to getting into this space? Yeah, sure. So, I guess the real estate and the hospitality piece, I don't know, they've always been sort of intertwined for me because I, when I was really young, I was fortunate I got to go stay and live in Spain for a summer as an exchange program. And I, you know, everything was totally different from where I grew up in California, Northern California. And I fell in love with traveling as a lot of us do. And I wanted to be able to explore that really like indefinitely. And so I, went to college and I studied international business thinking that would give me some sort of edge to be able to travel internationally. <laughs> that didn't work out too well. You know, I basically was serving tables even after I graduated college. So I luckily discovered the rich dad, poor dad book, like a lot of us have in the real estate world and realized this could be, this could be the way, you know, I'll get some properties. They will be passive. I'll be making money. And I like, uh, I like that I you, travel. for those that, for those that didn't see quote unquote passive, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was the idea. Right. And so I started down that journey. I, I, I got a job working for a software company and I was working as an independent contractor. So I had a lot of flexibility with my schedule, which was nice. So I was still traveling whenever I could staying in a lot of different types of accommodations. So in the early days, you know, I was broke. It was using couch surfing. We hosted people on couch surfing and then I stayed in a lot of short-term rentals over the years. So I, I was using Airbnb early on from the guest side, still working for the software company, but also starting to build a real estate portfolio. So I bought a fourplex was the first property that I bought and I rented, it was a foreclosure. I, I luckily got in right after the last crash, right? So 2010, and it's been a very nice wave going up. So I got lucky there. If you don't mind, um, if you don't mind me asking how, how old were you when you bought your first property? I was 24. Okay. Yeah, 24. So I, you know, what I learned from Rich Dad Poor Dad is that our, our home is not an asset, right? So I was able to fortunately start off on a good the good side of things. And I was living in that fourplex in one of the units for free. So I essentially never had to pay rent, never had a mortgage payment. It's always sort of working mm -hmm. for me. And I slowly built that up. You know, I was adding properties when I could. And I kept going down the real estate route. I became an investment broker selling investment properties in Northern California. I uh, worked for a small brokerage there, but it was really, really good experience. And we did really large deals. So apartment buildings and shopping centers and land okay. and industrial buildings and really, really good experience, especially when it comes to underwriting properties and just understanding all the, you know, the differences and what makes a good property, really, what makes a good investment. But that wasn't generating a lot of money and neither were my long-term rentals. You know, they were doing okay. They were paying for themselves, but they weren't generating a lot of money. And then I decided one day, this was in 2015, I decided to convert my first long-term rental into a short-term rental. And luckily it was in, it was in a good area where 
I thought it would do well as a short-term rental. Remember, mm-hmm. I was staying in lots of short-term rentals over the years, traveling and stuff. And it did really well. Long story short, it did really well. That was part of another fourplex that I had acquired. And so I ended up converting the other three units in there. And then that really freed up a lot of income. Like that property went from, you know, making five grand a month to making like 18 after I, I swapped them, you know. So it was, those were the early days and it stayed really well booked. There were no regulations anywhere. It just did really well, but it allowed me to diversify and start looking at other markets. And so from there, I sort of ventured out. I looked in a bunch of different states and I settled on Memphis, Tennessee. And I bought a small apartment building there, converted that. It was like, I'm saying it all, you know, like it happened quickly. It didn't happen quickly. It was a ton of work, you know, it was huge renovation projects and stuff. But I converted all eight of those units into short-term rentals. And really after that, I mean, I was like pretty much financially free. I could kind of do what I wanted. So I continued investing in real estate, but I also left the U.S., for the most part, I'd fallen in love with Columbia, of which you know very well, don't you? And, um, rings a bell. Columbia yeah. rings a bell. Yeah. <laughs> rings a bell. Yeah. Fell in love with the people and the culture. And I kept going back there. And so I, I ended up moving there more permanently. Still, still acquiring properties in the US because, you know, times were great. You know, interest rates were lower than they'd ever been in history. Stuff was easier, easier to cash flow. It was easier to pick up short term rentals. There's less competition. There's less regulations, all that stuff. So it was definitely a great wave. And I branched out a little bit. So I did buy a property in Colombia. I later on, just fast forward a little bit, I, I discovered Brazil. I really liked Brazil, where I am right now. And so I spent about half the year between both those. I got a property here and still working in short term rentals. Along the way, built a team to help me manage my own portfolio. And now our, our team's grown big enough to where we're managing properties for other people virtually. And so it's been it's been a fun journey. I feel like it's still kind of just getting started, but we've definitely learned a lot. That's very cool. So I want us to, you know, go back and, and sort of, you know, dig deeper into that journey. But before that, just so that people get a sense of, you know, how fast or not so how fast, but how far you've come. Uh, Can you give us an idea of where the portfolio sits at currently, you know, more or less, how many properties are you managing? How many properties, you know, do you have in your own, you know, investment Mm -hmm. portfolio that you own and, 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 you know, the size of your team, just, just so that we get a sense of like, how how big of an operation you've got yeah. right now going on? Yeah, so I acquired almost 70 units. Most of those are smaller apartment buildings. So two, three, four, five, six unit buildings. And not all of them. I didn't convert all of them into short-term rentals. So I think like around 40 are short-term rentals. And so mm-hmm. built up a team to help me manage those, uh, maybe 45. And we're now managing in total around 85. So we just started managing last year and we've added about 35 properties kind of from all over the place because we, we're doing it with, with a virtual approach. But yeah, it's been great. We, I mean, it seems like we're, we're adding properties every week and our team's just getting better and stronger. And, you know, it's been, it's been fun. Sweet, sweet. Now, because your, you know, investment portfolio is comprised of a lot of smaller plexes like you were mentioning, at least in Canada, you, you tell me how your journey was in the U.S. There's, you know, there's residential financing and there, there's commercial financing. And whenever it's, I think it's less than five units, you're you're on the residential side right. where it's really right. like, you know, your borrowing capacity, which is where a lot of people get limited in terms of how much they can scale the, that mm-hmm. investment portfolio. So I'm curious to know how, what, what was your strategy? So if we go back to like, First, first fourplex, you, you're house hacking, you know, mm-hmm. how do you go from that to sort of the next thing? What, what was, what was your approach to sort of continue adding properties along the way? Where, where the, was there, was there some creative financing involved? Was it just, you know, you mentioned foreclosing, uh, for, foreclosures mm-hmm. for the first one, like what, what was sort of your go-to approach to, you know, continue adding properties? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And and it wasn't it wasn't like just one approach. So the residential stuff, when I first got that property in 2010, it was tough times to get a loan. I mean, there was 
mass foreclosure, right? And so banks weren't lending that well. That was challenging, especially being an independent contractor, not receiving a W-2. I essentially put myself underneath the business and paid myself rent or not rent, but an income, a salary for like six months in order to qualify for that loan, which was, that was, you know, it was, it was challenging, but it worked. Uh, and so because that first property did not put me further into debt, you know, the lenders look at your debt to income ratio, my debt to income ratio actually improved after getting the first property. And it improved after getting the second property because the amount of income that I was making was going up, right? Versus, versus the debt. Uh, Cause in the residential space, they allow you to count your rent or at least 75% mm-hmm. usually towards your loan. And so these properties were covering themselves. So that helped mm-hmm. out. But when I went from residential to commercial, that's exactly right what you said. So five units or more, you enter the commercial world, which is totally different. Mm-hmm. It's totally mm-hmm. different. They look at the property as an investment and they also will look at your background, but it's, it's actually less important your financial position. Um, mm-hmm. if, if you went to go buy an apartment building, for example, and the apartment building was cash flowing way more than the bank was going to give you a loan for, they're going to feel comfortable giving you that loan, assuming that you have experience managing those types of properties and you have a little bit of experience there. So mm-hmm. I first went to an eight unit. That was my first commercial deal. And it wasn't easy getting a loan. And actually it almost fell apart like right at the end. And and so I was living in California at the time. I found this property as an out-of-stater and I had gone out to visit it. I had done the inspections. We were like through the whole negotiation. And at the very last moment, the bank I was working with, they they're like, hey Tim, sorry, like we can't give you the loan for this property. Like, you know, whatever it was, maybe my experience level or whatever. Which was, you know, I'm like, oh man, like, you know, I already spent all this money. I'm super excited. This property's got a lot of potential. What do I do? And I called a friend. And this is one of the great things about the commercial real estate world is that every bank, they're they're all different. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. one set of policies and rules that sort of applies to everyone. And so a lot of times your local banks can be a lot more flexible. And I reached mm-hmm. out to this local bank that my friend had referred and they knew the market well and they said yeah tim we'd we'd love to do the loan for you it's like i called him up this guy's name was heath he's got he's got his southern accent you know i'm not gonna i can't do i can't do the accents well but he's like yeah tim property looks great we'd love to give you the loan and oh by the way do you need some money for your renovation and i'm like a matter of fact i do because i was I, i put a lot of money into that property like 200 grand And originally I was planning on using my money. And so it just totally worked out. Um, I did that deal, worked with the the bank. They gave me a construction loan and they're still lending on that property today. And that's what, maybe seven, eight years. We've refinanced it since then. It pulled out a lot of equity. And that's, yeah, actually to go back to your question earlier, like kind of how did you continue scaling and growing? I was adding value to a lot of these properties, but the market... You know, all markets are different, but the markets that I were in were, were doing pretty well too. And so I was able to pull a lot of that equity back out, refinance, mm-hmm. and then use that money for other projects. And so that's kind of how, mm-hmm. how it went. That's interesting. And, and another one of the differences of, you know, residential, as you know, versus commercial loans is, let's say when it comes to that value add component on the residential side of things, you're limited to the comps in a way. Like you cannot mm-hmm. control you know, what the property is worth based on its income and, you know, increasing the income, reducing the costs, you know, increasing NOI and whatnot. Uh, Whereas on the commercial side, you can, but which, which is cool, right? When you're looking to leverage your own growth, but I'm curious to know. So first commercial, you know, deal, eight unit apartment building, you mentioned that you converted that into short-term rentals and that was sort of your way into short-term rentals. Was that part of the plan from the get-go when you were buying this property? Like, was that part of the due diligence? Like, can I convert this to a short-term rental property? Or did that come afterwards Mm -hmm. uh, after you had bought it? Yeah. So the very first short-term rental, that fourplex that I converted over, that was not the original plan with that property. I had it as a long-term rental for several years and then I converted oh, it. So the, but the after eight, seeing- like, The eight unit one was not the first. There was the four one, the four unit was the first uh, short-term rental. Right. Okay. 
That's right. Yeah. So the the eight unit one, yeah, that was definitely part of the plan. But back in the day, there were also not lenders giving you loans for short term rental properties. And so I was going to be my my question, right? It's (laughs) like, how did you go about that? It was occupied with long term tenants. And so it cash flowed on a long term rental basis. Not a lot, Mm. but it did. And so Mm. that was my way in getting these these loans, you know, you, you get a loan based on how the property is the day you acquire it. Um, Mm -hmm. and I switched it over and the income went much higher, you know, and I happened to be depositing that income into an account with the same bank. And again, a smaller local bank where you have like a a branch manager that gets to know you, those types of things. And so Mm -hmm. they were my way into getting loans for other properties too. When you, in that market were able to convert that apartment building from long-term to short-term and eventually refinance, like you said you did, mm-hmm. Was did, did the bank consider your short-term rental revenues as part of that refinancing? Or how did you go about that piece? A good question. I would say that they didn't too much. So they based it on just the value of the property after all the improvements that I had done. I know that there's a lot of banks and lenders now considering, you know, the value of a property because it's a short term rental. But at the time that I refinanced that, it wasn't, it was still sort of in that gray area where banks aren't, weren't open to lending on the property as a short term rental. So not for that one. Do you have, have you, have you experienced, you know, as your real estate journey has continued to develop nowadays, you know, situations where you've been financed based on, you know, short-term rental, either projections or, you know, historical data? Is that something you've now been able to benefit from? Sort of that openness from more financial institutions to look at SDR as a as a serious thing? I've definitely spoken with a lot of lenders and gotten quotes essentially from them. But the best loans that I've gotten have been based not based on short-term rental projections. So I think the interest rates, especially with a lot of these smaller local banks, they're just still much more comfortable with it on a long-term basis. And so they're valuing it that way. But I also, mm-hmm. I believe, got got uh, slightly better interest rates and terms because of that. Okay. Okay. So better better terms. Yeah. Better, I guess, better loan to values and, and whatnot when it's long-term yeah. as well. Actually... I take that back though. I, I did refinance a couple other properties a couple years ago, luckily right before all the rates started going up. And they definitely looked at short-term rental historic performance. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, I I mean I've had this conversation over and over again with different guests on the this podcast because there's this there's this I would say hope or this thesis that a lot of say you know investors have that that you know you, they can they can go out and, and and you see a lot of funds sort of doing this now go out and buy a lot of you know single family sort of put it put it together and then you know the thesis is that there's going to be appetite from institutional investors to buy such portfolios based on cap rates right mm-hmm. and of course you know, if that's the case and, and the, the revenue you have is short-term rental revenue, then, you know, you got, you got yourself a pretty, a pretty, you know, exit there. Like you, you bought, mm-hmm. you bought in a single family, converted to STR, and then you exit, you know, based on, based on cap rates with those bumped up, you know, increased uh, revenue figures. Have you, have you ever mm-hmm. sold any of your properties as sort of turnkey, you know, short term rentals, or have you have you have you have has your strategy been mainly, you know, buy and hold? Yeah, I think that that's definitely my strategy. You know, it's and that's, but I have sold properties to roll into other properties, so ten thirty one exchanges, and yeah. a couple, and they were operating as short term rentals. I wouldn't say at the time that I sold those, they got any sort of large premium because they were short-term rentals. But I would say that when it comes to cap rates and sort of valuing properties like most people do in the commercial world using cap rates, I think that this this is definitely become much more common. 
but not for all properties. So like if it was a single family home, for example, if that property had a license, maybe in a restricted area, and it was very certain that that license wouldn't get taken away and it was renewable and definitely, then I think that's a situation where someone could sell that property based on a cap rate, just breaking it down with the market and saying, hey, they only allow 300 short-term rentals here. This property's performed this well over the last three years. And because there's limited supply, you know, there's no reason to expect that it will do drastically different than it's done. I think those are situations where someone could sell to investors at a premium. But like a general everyday home, I think those are still selling more based on comps for yeah, smaller okay. residential properties. Makes sense. Now you you mentioned that you you sort of achieved that you know that 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 dream let's call it you know of of having you know financial freedom so to speak mm -hmm. after that aid unit you know after that aid unit acquisition which is the dream that started with you reading you know rich that poor that you know a couple of years before that I'm curious to mm -hmm. know how did that change you know, the trajectory of your life moving forward, if, if it did in any way, meaning like, you know, prior to that, maybe you're working towards that goal of achieving financial freedom. You achieved mm -hmm. it. Did you keep just doing the same thing? Did you now sort of, you know, realize that you could focus on doing the things you were enjoying the most because now you were free to do it and you sort of double mm -hmm. down on that? What, what was sort of the impact of you achieving that milestone? on your life? Great, great question. Well, I'd say I definitely have the real estate bug. I don't know if that's ever going to go away. So like, I, I'm always looking at properties. It doesn't matter where I am. I'm like, oh, for sure. God, I wonder how much this property is. I wonder how much this could rent for. And then I also have the travel bug, which I don't see that going. Although it has, I've traveled so much now. It's like I've kind of settled down a little more. And sometimes I like just being in my routine. But one, one thing that definitely changed is that I, I left the United States, you know, for the majority of the year, but I still had all these properties in the US and they're short term rentals, which most of us know that they are not passive. I'm doing the air quotes again for anyone that's not watching the video here. They're a lot of work, you know, and there's a lot that goes into them. And so one of the things that happened that happened is as I left, yeah, I was able to hire managers like internally to really help me run everything. So I wasn't answering guest questions. I wasn't coordinating housekeepers and stuff like that, but it did allow me to basically improve all my systems virtually, you know? So I wasn't there to do any of these things or to view the properties or, or to view potentially new properties. And so all of these things that I used to do more locally, I sort of figured out how to do remotely in a much better way. And so I feel like that really just helped improve everything really and, and helped us achieve where we are today. Mm, yeah, because it kind of forces you to think differently, right? When, when, you, when your property mm -hmm. is in your backyard, it's easy to just go and, you know, fix the toilet or whatever, you know, <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if, you know, that's your thing or go and talk to the tenants or, or go and do the you know, the check-in or whatever it may be. But when it, when you're in another country, you you need to think differently, right? It, it needs to be a mindset mm -hmm. of like, how do, I, how do I put a process in place that can run without without my involvement? So what, what do you think were some of the key lessons that you learned that allowed you to, to accomplish that and, and still have a business that, that flourished. Yeah. Well, one of the things you just sort of mentioned there, like those systems or those operations or SOPs is, you know, we call them standard operating procedures, really perfecting those, but then also really building like my team skills, you know, and relationship skills, working with other people, because it's not, you know, we work, we have a fabulous team today and that didn't just kind of happen overnight. So I feel like every, everyone that's joined our team over the years is just, there was a lot of learning lessons there, you know, finding the right people mm -hmm. and making sure that they're, you know, know what they're doing and that they have support and that, you know, we're all kind of headed in the right direction together. That makes sense. Now, why, why did you leave the U.S.? Tell me a little bit more about, about that. 
Well, I, I just been traveling a ton. I, I think I traveled over like 80 countries and I went to lots of cities and I, I was, I would go back to the cities that I liked a lot. You know, I visit them multiple times and I kept going back to Medellin all, always in Colombia. Uh, I really loved it. The for one thing, the weather's really nice, right? They call it the city of eternal spring because the temperature is like always around 73, 75. It doesn't snow there. It's not super hot there. It's beautiful. Everything's green all the time. So that was one thing. The weather was nice. It was also the, the people there are, are really, really nice and friendly. And I, I, I enjoyed that. The cost of living is obviously much lower than it was in the US. So I felt like just the quality of life that you could live down there, have there for the price, it's just like a, a no brainer to me. And it still is. And it is it is for so many people now. I can't believe how much it's grown. I first went down mm-hmm. there in 2015. And yeah, I'm here in Brazil right now, but I'll be going back there in July for like the, the rest of the year. And it's just every time I go back, I can't believe it. There's so many more foreigners living there. And obviously, we can mm-hmm. live remotely now much easier than we could back in 2015. So, um, Yeah, no, there's been a big boom. I was there not too long ago. I mean, I, I am originally from, from Colombia. I've been living in Canada for 12 years now, if I'm counting correctly, maybe even more. But, but yeah, I was surprised too when I saw you know, Medellin. And, and, and we had an event going on there. I, th- I think I told you about it. And they gave us that. I don't know. I don't know if this is true. So don't quote me on it. But they were saying that it's become uh, the number one city for digital nomads. Like, it, I think it used to be Mexico City. And now apparently mm-hmm. Medellin has sort of uh, taken over. So that's a that's a pretty big deal, which leads me to talk about, you know, you actually have you know, very interesting projects that are being sort of cooked as we speak down in Medellin. And, and now you've, you've ventured into the, the actual development project of, you know, actually buying land and building. So tell us a little bit more about how you transition into becoming a developer. Was, you know, Medellin and this project that you'll tell us more about sort of your first you know, development experience or had you built already before and kind of wh- why did the, why did that make sense and, and why did you decide to do what you're doing currently in, in, in Medellin, which seems to be a, a very, very interesting project? Yeah. So I guess just the, the quick background on it. So I, I've spent a lot of time in, in Colombia and I've met a lot of people down there too. That's the other thing, as you mentioned, it's maybe one of the top, you know, digital nomad hubs, but there's a ton of amazing people there with businesses of all different kinds. It's one of the things I really liked because before that it was all like real estate, real estate, real estate. So I've got friends that have all different types of businesses, but naturally I gra- <laughs> uh, gravitated towards people that were also interested in real estate. And quite a lot of my friends have done other projects down there. So buildings and developments and stuff like that. And one of my friends that finished a really beautiful 11 story apartment building, 20 short term rentals, did a really good job on it. We were looking for a chunk of land to do another project on. So we were going to partner on it. And we spent a lot of time, as you might know, the real estate industry down there is much different. There is no MLS. You know, you might have four people selling the same property for four different prices. There might be 10 owners under the same property. It's it's much more challenging. But because it's so inefficient, there's also more opportunity there, right? When we put a house on on the MLS in the US, everyone knows more or less like what the value is because they can see all the other properties. And you can't do that down there. And so a lot of opportunity and a good friend of mine that's been down there for a long, long time, and he lives down there pretty much full time. He mentioned this lot. He knew that I was looking for a lot and and he said, Hey Tim, this this property came up for sale. Do you, are you interested in doing something on it? Uh, and I was like, heck yeah. You know, it's a, a beautiful lot. It's it's in Poblado for anyone that, that knows the city, Medellin. But it, one of the, like where everyone stays in the city, it's close to the airport. It has amazing views. So that's one of the cool things about the city too. It's a valley and the views are just incredible. So this is a really nice lot on the side of the mountain, but it also happens to be flat. So where you can actually build without crazy retaining walls and stuff, which is pretty rare there. So great lot. And we went into contract November, what is it? 2024, November of 2022. 
We went under contract and we did do an owner's finance situation for this one. So the lot itself was pretty expensive. And one of the challenges with purchasing property internationally is that you also can't just go to the bank and get a loan because unless you're earning income in that country, it's the same way it is in the US. Like if you don't have any income to show that banks don't want to give you a loan. So luckily we, we worked out a seller financing deal with with these owners, three owners that have owned the property forever, you know, maybe 30, 40 years it's been in the family. And the plans, we're still going through the permitting actually, but I think we're almost there. The plans right now are for 15 short-term rentals. So it'll be essentially a small community, you know, nice private entrance with a, a clubhouse, with a pool and a restaurant. We don't plan on operating the restaurant, but we do have another friend there that's opened several restaurants. We're hoping that he's going to fulfill that, that part. Yeah. So it should be r- really cool. And a place where... You know, people have privacy. It's in the city, but you're not next to all the traffic noise. You're close enough to take Uber everywhere. You can order from a service called Rappi, which is essentially like a delivery oh, service down there. You can, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You can order anything from a toothbrush to like, you know, moving boxes It's and food and everything. So I'm really excited for it. I think it's got a ton of opportunity. And the, as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's a hub for digital nomads. And it's much cheaper for them to live down there. And so there's a ton of demand, right? There's a ton of demand down there. And the nice thing for us, yeah, the property wasn't super cheap. Prices have risen there like they have around the world, really. But we get to build with Colombian waiver. Waiver. My English has gotten really bad not living in the U.S. for a while. It just blur words. Too much Spanish Spanish and Portuguese, Um, right? Yeah. But uh, labor is much cheaper, and our rents should should be should be really high. We have good data down there on Price Labs and Air DNA and these tools that we use in in the US too. So excited that's for it. Cool. it! Should be a good, great project. That's, that's pretty cool. And you're not selling, you know, the 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 units, right? You are sort of a building and and operating as a as an owner operator essentially. Correct. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And was that your first time? developing building you know from the ground up everything uh, before this had been you buying existing property correct yeah so this first development i I feel like some of the rehabs i did were basically developments because they were in such bad shape but uh, no never done Uh anything from the ground up my partner on this deal though has he's he's got two other projects there in the city and so it's not brand new for him Uh, Mm -hmm. okay okay and, and other point. other than other than you know things take time and even more so in Colombia, what what else have you learned in this process as you know I'll I'll say you know first time developer. Yeah, the the permitting can take forever. You know, I mean they have zoning like they have in the U.S. and it, it's much more advanced than most people probably think. I mean it's broken down to where you can pull up a parcel online and see what you're allowed to build there. And so we bought this property with a commercial license, which is great. That's one of the other things that I'm really bullish on is that they're actually got pretty strict short-term rental regulations in the city, which is limiting a lot of the supply. You know, a lot of these properties are high-rise apartment buildings or condominium buildings. They've had owners that have lived there for a long time. And if there's not a majority vote for the building, to allow short-term rentals, then you're not allowed to operate a short-term rental there. And that's the majority of properties there. So I do think the supply is is limited, um, which is great for you know <laughs> our situation. But the permitting process can can take forever. You know, it can take a really long time in the US and it, it's taken a really long time down there. So that's been a challenge for sure, you know, navigating uh, we've got all of our architectural plans and stuff like that, but you know, as the city changes, like they had a a changing of managers essentially in the permitting office where we were applying for this project, and we're like almost to the end getting the green light, and they switch management, and it's like we had to start over. You know, it's like they have new people come in, so that's been challenging. It's been a learn, learning process, but it's, I feel like we're, we're almost there and there's definitely oh, light cool. at the end of the tunnel. And in terms of the seller financing piece, I don't know if you had done seller financing before, or, you know, this is, this was the first time, but what, what do you think helped you or what do you think allowed you to get that 
seller financing, you know, what, what are sort of the, the ways in which you would suggest people go about it? Because it's, it's simply like simply saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to pay, you know, the entire thing or, or I'm not getting, you know, mm -hmm. lending from the bank. He's not going to cut it. You want to sort of try to make it seem like it's a benefit for the seller, right? Uh, you're going to, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to be deferring your capital gain tax. I mean, at least, you know, in, in, in North America, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what do you think allowed you to, because I'm just thinking that if people are skeptical about seller financing in, in Canada, And maybe in the U.S. too, I would I would expect people in in Colombia to be even more skeptical about something like that, given you know the the cultural mindset of you know being very careful because there's there might be you know thieves or fraud and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Not that there's all not that there's only that, but you know it is a consideration. So yeah, how did you? go about it how did you go about getting that that seller financing and and what do you think allowed you to get it in the first place yeah i think several things there one the negotiating in colombia it's there's not as many mortgages outstanding mortgages in colombia or internationally for that matter like getting loans is not as prevalent as it is in the us so a lot of people own these properties outright and a lot of them have appreciated you know huge, huge amounts, just like a lot of properties have in the US. And like this particular case, it's owned by the family. It's been there forever. And so they're selling it at, you know, who knows, like 3,000% more than whatever they paid for it. So that's the first thing. They actually have the ability to do it because they don't have a mortgage. There are lots of properties too in the US that don't have mortgages. A lot of the baby boomers, for example, own their properties outright. It, I always hear different numbers, but I think it's like you know, 30 or 40% of the homes in the U.S. don't have mortgages on them. So there's a lot of opportunity for that in the U.S. too. So I think that's the first thing. They had the ability to do it. They're getting the asking price that they wanted. And mind you, like owner financing, sky's the limit in terms of how you actually structure the deal. So like we have interest factored in to the payments and things like that. But we also have it written in the contract where the title is not actually fully in our name until we pay for the full property. And so I'm sure that that gives them a lot more, you know, security knowing that like, hey, it's not quite in their name yet. I guess the other thing is relationships, you know, so my my partner on this is he's got a good relationship with them. Like we've had coffee at their the seller's house multiple times. And and so I think the relationship goes a long way, just sort of putting that trust in there. We're also, you know, we've spent a lot of time in there. We're not just like foreigners kind of passing mm -hmm. through. We have projects yeah. there, we have other properties and stuff. So I think it all kind of goes, goes into the picture. But the, the nice thing about seller financing is it literally sky's the limit. I mean, you can, however you want to structure it, if the both parties are okay for it, we're always searching yeah. for the win-win, right? If both parties are okay for it, then, then we can move forward. And, and in your case, what was sort of the, the uh, high level structure, you know, the, the, the big picture, you know, structure, was it interest only for a certain period of time? And then you, you got into like, you know, payments that included principal or, uh, you know, it was, was there a certain amortization uh, that you guys sort of try to try to go higher with? Like what, what were sort of the, the main, the main wins? for you and, and the, the deal in terms of the, the way you structure this seller financing? Yeah. So originally we were expecting to get the license approved in like a few months. And our, the way our contract was written is that once we got the licenses approved, we, could, we would pay half of the whole property. But of course, the licenses didn't get approved right away and we're still working on that. And so that's gotten delayed. And so we had to change. We've changed our agreement several times. We went in and added mm. interest to it. We started paying all the property tax on the property. So like they don't have any additional fees. So we've ended up paying more than we would have, but we've been paying principal the whole way along. And the original idea was that, okay, we would get the license approved. And then from that point, we would have 18 additional payments. So a year and a half to pay off the rest of the, the lot. And we were planning on using some income from the properties 
assuming that they would have been built already. And so that really hasn't panned out. And so we're really having to pay for the whole lot, you know, just kind of out of pocket, which is bummer. But it's still a really good lot. And I would say, even though we've paid more interest and stuff, just over the last two years, I mean, who knows? The market's appreciated a ton. In fact, I was just talking with with my partner the other day. We're exchanging WhatsApp messages, and he said, "Hey, they put the the lot for sale that's right below ours, and these are these are large lots. Ours is ours is a hectare, so I think it's like two point something acres. It's a good size and a great spot of town. And the one that's going below is selling for like twice as much per square meter. And so, even though we haven't been able to build on it yet," And even though it's cost us more than we were planning, I mean, if we look at it from that end, it's it's still worked out well for us. It's still worked out well for the sellers. They're still able to sell the property and they're getting, you know, slightly more than they anticipated. That's amazing. Tim, uh, I could literally stay here with you for another two hours, I'm sure, just chatting. And, and, uh, you know, I I think it's, it's very interesting just to sort of wrap things up. If if you were to give some final advice to, you know, someone listening to this that wants to wants to go through that journey that you did of of becoming, you know, financially independent and also, you know, by the way, this advice also I think coming from you consolidates everything you've learned from the hundreds of episodes of your own podcast, right? Where where you also mm-hmm. have learned a ton and and through doing it, through through talking with other experts, what what would be some sort of final words of advice or inspiration for anyone there that wants to scale their you know portfolio and 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 build wealth with with short term rentals and, and real estate? Gosh, I, I think it it just you know we're we're talking about investments here, and it just always comes down to the numbers. And the numbers tell us what to do. So I really learned that in my early days working with that as an investment broker. We had some spreadsheets and we crunched numbers. And if it didn't make sense, then we didn't buy it. So I know there are always opportunities. There still are. So you know we're managing properties now. And some of our partners that have joined us, I know how much they paid for the properties. And I know how much they earn now. And some of them are crushing it. You know, so I know there's tons of opportunity out there still. We just have to be very diligent in that process because if we don't run the numbers right and we get in over our head, then that could like, you know, potentially crush our real estate career. We never get to that next stage. So I think that's the first piece. And that's different for everyone across the board. You know, there it might be someone looking to get into real estate that already has a good job and this is sort of a side hustle. Maybe they are open to a little bit more risk, but someone that's getting into that property that's relying on that income, you don't want to get a property that's not going to cash flow, you know, or that you're expecting to or that you're hoping to cash flow. It's just like not a not a good uh not a good strategy. And so luckily, there's tons of resources out there, tons of excellent podcasts and YouTube channels and downloads and all these things where we can get some analysis calculators. We can get data from Price Labs and AirDNA to just look at these numbers and make sure we don't get in over our head. Um, but there's definitely tons of opportunity. We see it. We, we see it every week still. On the writing, be careful with your on the writing. Uh, be be conservative. Is basically, I think, yeah. a very good good piece of advice. Uh, well, listen, team. Thank you, man. Thank you for taking the time. Where where can people connect with you? Follow on for your podcast. Uh, stay in touch with you. Yeah, our our podcasts are is called Short Term Rental Riches. And our website, strriches.com. We've got all of our past episodes. I can't believe it's been you know, over four years. So well, we've talked about you have, you have hundreds of episodes, right? Yeah, we do. And they're maybe 240 now. They're all quick, actionable items. So that was sort Crazy. of the whole idea was just to uncover little tips. And we do have a, a, a really cool ebook on management where we broke down all the stuff that we do. People can download that for free at strriches.com as well. So awesome. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Amazing team. Well, I look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, if not in Colombia, in Brazil, if not, if you ever yeah. pass by the U S uh, for some of the <laughs> many conferences that we go to, yeah. I'd love to see you in person too. And 
have a have a great day and thank you so much for sharing all this all this wisdom and and golden nuggets of advice that i think are going to help a lot of people i i definitely learned a ton yeah thanks for having me on all right take care